The first speaker of the evening will be Connor Sullivan. Connor is a senior in the Lynch School of Education and first became interested in educational achievement gaps after volunteering during his freshman year as a mentor for the AmeriCorps program, Friends of the Children of Boston. He then became involved with educational research as a student worker at the TIMSS and PIRLS International Study Center and as an undergraduate research assistant studying the effects of social media in the college classroom with Dr. Anna Martinez Ailman. Connor's talk tonight is based upon his honors senior thesis and will discuss the large gaps in school achievement between students from disadvantaged backgrounds and students from more privileged backgrounds, and the potential that a full service education model may have as an alternative method to bridging this gap by offering services to improve the whole child. Please join me in welcoming Connor Sullivan. Thank you, Tim. Um, so my name is Connor Sullivan, and I'll be speaking to you tonight on my senior thesis, an alternate approach to bridging the achievement gap, uh, full service education. So before I start, I want to talk about why I actually embarked on this project. As Tim mentioned, uh, my freshman year, I became involved in a program called Friends of the Children of Boston. I was assigned to be a mentor uh, for a child in Dorchester um, named Devante, uh, twice per week. Um, I would go to Devante's school and I would help him with various homework assignments and then I would take him on outings uh, throughout the city. But my primary role was to be a liaison between Devante's parents, his teachers, his social worker, his guidance counselor. And in this experience, I realized that one of the reasons that Devante was struggling in school and on standardized tests was because he did not have the community um, to support him. He did not have the same resources as um, middle and high income students. Um, in, in his educational journey. So before I start, I want to talk a little bit about what exactly is the educational achievement gap. The achievement gap is uh, the disparity in school performance between different groups of students. Most often, this refers to socioeconomic groups. So this is a result from the 2011 National Assessment for Educational Progress. The top two lines are students that either did not report or students that did not qualify for free or reduced lunch, which is how our government determines socioeconomic status. The line below that are students that qualify for reduced lunch, and the line below that are students that qualify for free lunch. As you can see, students that qualify for reduced lunch were about 15 points below those students um, that did not qualify, and students that qualify for free lunch were about 25 points below. The same deficits were seen in English language arts. Students that qualified for reduced lunch were about 15 points below those students that did not qualify, and students that qualified for free lunch were about 25 points below. However, the achievement gap is not um, solely seen in standardized test scores. It's also seen in other educational domains. Um, while an updated study has not been completed, in 2003 it was discovered that only 8% of low-income students enrolled in what's considered a rigorous course load. So these are the honors and AP courses that many students at BC took while in high school. So what is currently being done about this issue? There are two main pieces of legislation which are often talked about in bridging the achievement gap. One is the 2001 No Child Left Behind Act. This act required states to come up with state assessments that would measure their students' um, progress in bridge bridging the achievement gap. They require them to set goals for adequate yearly progress in order to meet these goals. There's also the 2009 Race to the Top Act, which is a competitive grant program in which states would actually apply for additional federal funding for their education programs. Uh, applications were uh, evaluated on their ability to, for instance, come up with data collection systems, teacher evaluation models, any way that these ch um, schools were attempting to bridge the achievement gap in standardized test scores. However, as seen in the graphs below, these um, have largely been unsuccessful. And the reason I became so frustrated by these acts is because, in a way, they're basically trying to uh, cure pneumonia with a cough drop. They're looking at one specific part um, of the educational issue, which is standardized test scores. However, um, as we know in education, there are many additional factors which are pre preventing students like my mentee, Devante, from succeeding. So what's another alternative approach of solving this issue? Uh, my research is fo focused on full service education. Um, this um, approach uh, focuses on schools um, that are high achieving, but also that add on additional factors, such as um, social programs, academic programs, health programs, basically any factors that middle and high income students um, would take for granted in their households, but giving those additional resources to, to those low income students. 
in my thesis, um, I focus on three different case studies. Um, my first being the City Connects program, which is actually right here in Boston, Massachusetts. The City Connects program um, works in that um, partner schools in the Boston area will partner with local uh, community resources. Um, these, uh, and then the way the pr uh, program works, that there's a school site coordinator um, at each of the schools that works with each of the classroom teachers. Uh, the classroom teachers will work with the school site in order to identify needs of their students. So for example, a teacher might notice that a child in school does not have nutritious meals um, every day. They might notice that they're not eating breakfast in the morning. That school site coordinator will be able to refer that child and their family to a nutritionist um, that has agreed to partner with the City Connects program. The second is the Harlem Children's Zone, um, which is arguably the most famous full service model. This uses what's considered the conveyor belt strategy, in that from the moment a child is conceived up until the moment that chi um, child is actually in college, there are services along the way to help that child. Um, the program starts um, in what's called baby college. So the moment a uh, mother becomes pregnant or recently gives birth, they um, get brought into a support group uh, to talk with other mothers, to talk with volunteers about different ways, uh, for instance, prenatal care, child rearing strategies, how this actually affects your family. This goes right up until a three-year-old journey program, up until a, pro a preschool program called Harlem Gems, and then a K through 12 charter school system um, that follows them right up until college. Throughout this entire educational journey, there are a multitude of services um, that basically are given to that child, for ranging from free health and dental services, amazing after school programs that focus on the arts. Again, any option you can possibly imagine that a middle or high income student would take for granted, these low income students are getting. There's also the Seed School in Washington, D.C., and most recently in Baltimore, Maryland. This school is the most intensive full service model that I evaluated, in that they actually take the child out of their um, low income environment and put them in the first urban public boarding schools in the country, so that these children are actually in school from Sunday night until Friday, beginning in the first grade. So they actually take them out of the environment to do that. So what are the results of these full service schools? How are they actually effective? So the City Connects research is actually done right here at Boston College. As you see in mathematics, um, Massachusetts is known as having one of the top education programs in the country. In this graph, um, you can see that just under 50% of children are proficient in mathematics. The City Connects, um, in a light blue, is actually just below that model. The researchers at Boston College also used um, comparison schools. So these are schools that have similar demographics, the same number of low-income students at their schools, and also the Boston Public School Districts. And as you can see, that the City Connects program far outscores them in mathematics. These same gains are seen in English language arts. While not quite um, as much as mathematics, they still outscore those comparison schools and Boston Public Schools. As we've talked about, Full service um, education, the entire education issue in general, is not just about standardized test scores. It's also about other areas. Um, one of the areas that City Connect analyzes is what's called work habits. So on report cards, this is where teachers would say how much effort are they putting into assignments? What organization skills do they have? The skills that translate to success later on in higher education. And as you can see, City Connect students outscore comparison schools in that aspect as well. The Harlem Children's Zone. Um, this program is set up slightly different um, than the City Connects program in that there are lottery winners, so students that are accepted into the Promise Academy, which is the charter school system, and lottery losers, so students that were not accepted into the lottery. And this is how they measured um, the gains of that program. Um, the first is a bell curve. Um, the top is the math scores. The blue are lottery winners. And as you can see, the entire bell curve from fifth through eighth grade moves to the right, meaning that whether you are a low achiever or a high achiever or middle of the road achiever, everyone is improving from fifth through eighth grade. While the gains are not as dramatic in English language arts, there is that slight improvement. Um, this is the mathematics results. Um, along with measuring uh, lottery winners and lottery losers, they also compared data to the average white student um, in New York City and the average black student. The average white student is the gray line up at the top. As you can see in mathematics, the average low-income student from the Harlem Children's Zone almost eclipsed that of the average white student. And then actually did com um, eclipse that mark um, in the next year. In English language arts, the gains are not quite as dramatic. However, once again, the lottery winners, so students that were accepted into the Harlem Children's Zone, um, outscored those students 
um, that were not accepted along with the average black student in New York City. There's not quite as much data uh, about the Seed School because it is a relatively new full service program. However, recent studies have shown that about 65% of Seed students um, score proficient in reading and about 74% were proficient in mathematics. Um, when comparing to the average DC public school student, about 2.211 standard deviation increase in mathematics, uh, excuse me, in English language arts and 0.229 standard deviation increase in math. So the question that most education policy advocates um, and government officials ask is, is this actually worth the cost? How much is full service education going to cost? The Harlan Children's Zone spends about $16,000 per year on per pupil. And this is not including some of the additional costs along with the program, the building costs, the after school programs. So you can imagine this number is actually a lot higher than the 16,000 that they report. However, New York City Public Schools only spends about $14,000 per year. Seed Public School, the uh, Urban Public Boarding School, spends about $40,000 per student per year on its program, which is compared to only $20,000 in Washington, D.C. The City Connects program is the most inexpensive of the program in that they actually do not have services attached to the school because they use the community resources. So the only additional cost is the school site coordinator which is only, um, adds up to only about $500 extra per student per year. However, the graph which most education policy um, uh, researchers look to is this graph developed um, by Brown University. What um, Brown University did was that they actually looked at, rather than comparing the Harlem Children's Zone to other public schools in New York City, they compared it to high achieving charter schools in the area. So as you can see, the Harlem Children's Zone did have a positive effect on student achievement. However, all the schools on the right are other high achieving charter schools. The one farthest to the right is actually a KIPP school, which is one of the most famous types of charter schools. So when I analyzed this data, at first I became very discouraged in seeing that clearly their full service schools are not as effective as these charter schools. But then what I started to realize is that's not what education is all about. What well, we learn as Boston College students that there is this idea of cura personalis and that education is about um, in educating the whole person, helping that child break the cycle of poverty. It's not just about the standardized test scores and improving that student's math or English language arts knowledge. It's about breaking the cycle of poverty by helping them understand what it's important to eat in the morning, what's actually important in terms of those work habits, what uh, effort, um, organizational skills. So moving forward, educational policy needs to shift from focusing solely on standardized test scores, which is only one small part of the educational issue in this country, and focusing on the larger issue um, that our nation faces. Thank you very much.